Welcome, everybody. Uh, try to find a seat. There are some seats left here and there. Wow, almost a full hall. Uh, right, just so you know, I can barely see you because I have the lights in my eyes, but you can hopefully see me and hear me properly. Um, last year when I was here, I was talking about um, Hadoop, which was the topic before, I realized, by Cloudera. So I was talking together with Cloudera last year. Uh, this year it's much more uh, developer-oriented as per request. Um, so we <clears throat> tried to come up with a title for this talk. And uh, the title is actually a bit fitting. It's not like uh, we have a DDoS attack coming to our site, but we have quite a few requests, as you will see. And so it, it almost feels like it. Um, I'm the server architect for King. I've been with the company for four years. I co-developed some of the servers that we run. Uh, most of the design decisions are lucky and evolved. So I was thinking, what should I share of the architecture when I'm here? And what I'm going to try to do is share the few things and experiences that I think could be relevant if you're in a position where you need to develop something similar. Uh, and that means it's not going to be exactly hands-on, and it's not going to be very architectural, but something in between. Um, but please save questions for, for later. I'm, and I'm going to stay, so if you want to have a beer and chat, that would be awesome, actually. <clears throat> so first, I approached um, a mobile company that also makes a popular desktop. Uh, they're struggling a bit in the mobile business, and I appro approached them, and they saw, oh, King, are you with the magazine? Um, so it <laughs> still happens, less and less so. Uh, it could have been. So I'm going to just introduce what King is and what we do, because apparently not everybody knows it. Uh, so we're <coughs> boring interactive entertainment company. I'll try to come up with something more interesting. This is cut from our company presentation site. So we, we develop games and we publish them ourselves. We host everything. We, we make them. We sell, if you will, directly to customers. Uh, the only partners we cooperate with are uh, social graph providers like Facebook, uh, and distributors that can, can charge money from customers, like Apple, Google, Amazon, um, and others. So not a lot of integration or third-party struggle. We, we are in charge of our own code and what we do. So the success we had was with some kind of saga concept, where the idea is you play a game, a tiny game, uh, and you get a score. And uh, then you progress to the next level if you pass a certain score, and you get one to three stars, depending on how good you are. Uh, and this uh, progress is stored on our servers. So that's basically the, the entire thing we do with a server architecture. Then you can request a high score list with a selection of your friend or all your friends. Mm, you can see where your friends are, how far they've progressed. Uh, if you play on a mobile device and then pick it up on the web, you have the same progress. So it's, it's stored on the, on the servers, but it's also stored on the mobile, so it's synced back and forth. All pretty basic. A lot of companies had this when we started having it. Um, but then we had some successes, and it's become almost iconic. So this is a privilege to be working with, because as a server developer, uh, also a games developer, but so Having a game become this iconic means that there will be a lot of traffic coming to your site, and that's awesome. So you probably all know it, except this person from the mobile company. So 2003, the company started. A modest start. In 2004, I applied for the job at Midas Player for the first time, and I didn't get it. Mm. Oh, never mind, I applied again, and I got it, so everything's fine. <laughs> um, back in 2007, we had 80 million games played per month. Pretty okay. 2009, approximately when I applied, uh, there were 350 million games played per month. So that was a staggering amount. But the next number, a billion games played, are actually per day, and that was last year. 
So that's how many games people play and report to our servers every day, or was. I can't share the exact figures for some reason, because it's a company secret. Uh, I can share the entire architecture, that's fine, that's not secret. <laughs> <laughs> so. So the secret is how many players you need to have. So, so this is approximately the setup. Uh, very simplified. It is actually quite simple. We don't use a service-oriented architecture. So it's uh, pretty straightforward. And this illustrates most of the components that we have. And I, I saw some colleagues snuck into this presentation. Uh, I hope they don't learn anything new from this. But this is roughly true, actually. So I put some numbers in here that I managed to clear. Um, we have approximately 250,000 web requests coming in per second. And the reason I'm presenting this is not to, to brag, but to make this presentation relevant and explain why we solved some problems in a bit different way than you might have chosen yourself. Um, uh, to the database system, including the caches, we have 1.8 million reads per second from these requests. And it generates around 50,000 writes per second. So that's roughly 60 megabytes. Each write is average about a kilobyte. So not very big. And then we have some auxiliary systems where we also write off data to, and that's approximately 250,000 separate writes per second. So this is around, around about the volume we have. So I would like to pause a bit. Um, we didn't know this up front, but now when I present it, I would like you to sort of consider what kind of solutions you would put in place if it was you that was given this specification and needed to implement it. And uh, I think there are some people here who have, have similar volume or similar problems, at least. For comparison, while you're thinking, I can uh, share that the Olympics website for 2012 Olympics in London, they peaked at 98,000 requests per second. And most sites uh, don't generate these many requests per day normally. All right? Have an idea? Any ideas? If you have ideas, I would love you to pitch them to me on a, <clears throat> over a beer because. The solution we chose is extremely simple, and it's a bit like a Russian technology. It works, it's very simple and crude, but if you have experience with volume and some fancy, nice solution, I would really like to hear about it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the focus for this talk is going to be around the app servers, which are written in Java, and the databases, which are <clears throat> written in uh, regular languages, C. <clears throat> so, the first thing we did, um, we started to uh, eliminate unrealistic requirements. And I come from a gambling background, so I've been working, I haven't been gambling, but <laughs> I've been working with providing people the ability to gamble. Uh, and then it's extremely important that all transactions are actually treated as such and that you have a sort of uptime is 100% correct, especially when you have a casino. Uh, if if there's a delay of more than 2.7 seconds, people are going to react to that change in delay and contact the, the pit boss on the floor and say something's wrong with your system. So then things were really strict and you had to have fail-safe solutions for everything. Uh, so one thing we started to loosen was that hmm, maybe everything doesn't have to be that predictable and, and sort of reliable. Um, if the system is down for a few seconds each day, or maybe not each day, but 30 seconds every two weeks, maybe that's okay. Um, because that, that's still a very little impact. We also relaxed what people can see. So we don't expect people to sit just next to each other and compare, oh, but I just got this score, where is it? Uh, so that, that's also something that we, we made it easier for ourselves. Uh, and another thing is when we have situations where two things need to be done at the same time, uh, usually you can do it in an order so that you make the, the most beneficial for the player thing first. So you give them the stuff and then you charge the money. 
Uh, that way, if something goes no wrong, nobody's going to complain, and delivering virtual goods isn't that expensive anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds obvious, but you never know. <clears throat> and then think about, I think this has been said in other words previously today at some presentation, uh, don't, don't be sort of too strict about things. There's no, absolutely no reason for it. I talk to auditors and, and people working with the finance and our books, and you, you, if you talk to them and they say, hey, two and a half percent, if you don't know where they are, that's fine. I mean, <laughs> nobody expects things to be perfect. But you need to be aware of systematic error, so you don't have a multiplicative effect somewhere. But if you lose something and you know that all that happened was that you lost a percent of stuff that you don't know what it is, fine. <laughs> all right. Uh, so when we started uh, on Facebook and mobile, we realized that we were going to do something that we haven't done really before. Um, so we, we realized traffic would be much, much higher than the regular site that we had before. We had a site called king.com, now royalgames.com, and a few hundred thousand players every day. Uh, but Facebook was so much bigger, so we, we wanted to design something that can handle a bit more traffic. So we started with a very conservative start. What we had, we built on that, we elaborated and sort of uh, didn't dive into experimenting with new technology. Uh, and that got us off the ground real fast. Uh, I'm not saying they got this one up off the ground real fast, uh, because this one, I think they had to build like 20 or so before it actually took off properly. <clears throat> so we started with a little bit of Hibernate, to be fair, but none of us really knew how Hibernate worked. And the consequence of that is, as you might know, that you leak memory and you're going to have both first-level caches uh, flooding and second-level caches flooding, depending on how, what kind of keys you have. So we threw out Hibernate quite quickly. Um, and other J2E solutions were not alien to us, but we weren't really familiar with the inner workings. So ch choosing them for us would have been the wrong choice. So we started growing our own, and we rescued what we have from other code bases, and the company was already seven years old by then, so we had a lot of nice stuff that we just rescued. And some of it I'm going to present today, and that's stuff that is like 10 years old, but not always used. So we took what you always need to have a nice dish, MySQL and Memcached. It's like the butter and cream that makes it all good. Is anybody here who, who doesn't use MySQL in production? Yeah. Very few. Yeah, as I expected. So it's, it's, it, is, it is the butter. <laughs> it's, it's the shit. So on top of that, we, we actually built uh, a simple abstraction. And this is, again, very Russian technology. Uh, we call it a data store, and this data store is what uh, gets all these writes, the 50,000 writes uh, per second. <clears throat> and it's just a, a blob storage. The key is the, usually the player, the player ID or the user ID. Uh, it could be the user ID and something else, uh, because we can have sub keys, but it's still a string as the index. Uh, and then it's a blob of data. And the, the cool thing about that, Oh, the, oh, yeah, the API is just get, set, uh, delete. That's all you can do. And you can actually get it with a lock operation as well. Uh, row lock in InnoDB is quite cheap. So the clever thing about this is that we design it in a way so that nobody can fiddle with the data in the database except the application server. Only the application servers know how to generate this blob. Uh, and the, the people administering or who want to extract data from the system can't because it's a blob. You need the secret decodering inside the application server to be able to encode it and decode it. Uh, and that was a cl quite clever thing. Uh, on top of that, because working with a blob is going to be difficult and people don't know what a schema is and they don't know how to keep the versioning on the schema correct and uh, you're going to have all kinds of problems if you just store binary data and let people serialize it as they wish. So we added a JSON store on top of it. 
And that's again the same operations you recognize it from the NoSQL world. Uh, a get and a set, delete, and then an update operation, which is uh, we removed the locked part from this one because that generated a lot of mistakes by the developers. So we encourage them to use this one where they pr provide an update with an operation, which is just like in Hibernate, you have do work. Uh, you just send in what you want done, and you get a locked row. You make your operation. When you return the data, it, it updates it and, and releases the transaction. Makes it very easy to to do an atomic update without forgetting to commit or lock before. And then on top of that, I'm going to talk more about the, the sharding uh, in a while. On top of that, we added a, a user JSON store. So you see how we're sort of building on top of each other now. A user JSON short is, store is something that shards data based on a user ID. You can shard on anything in our system, but m the most common one is the sharding on user, because we have billions of users. So it's the same operations, get, set, update. Not sure if I have a delete there, actually. I, I provided a, a subset of the functions we have. We also have back batch functions to get multiple uh, <coughs> entries and uh, I think update multiple entries, maybe. Hmm. And the reason we made this abstraction and not let people fiddle directly in the database was that we wanted um, any developer to be able to use it without thinking. So it, with this abstraction, that makes it very easy for a, a developer who doesn't know m much about sharding or serialization or deserialization. They just have a, an object, a, a class, that we serialize using JSON into a blob for them, and we can deserialize it. We're going to look a bit more into what we promise more with the serialization. Uh, we cut a lot of uh, support for stuff as well, what you can serialize and deserialize. We don't follow it strictly, but mostly. So when we read and write data, we only allow very primitive types, uh, arrays, and a class with fields containing these types. Uh, and that was also a beneficial solution, because that means that we could change the serialization and deserialization protocol. We didn't change the way we store it, but we changed the JSON serializer once already. And it also makes support in other languages easier. So we not only use JSON in the database, we also use it in, uh, in the protocol. And that uh, means that if we limit the data types, it makes it easier to write clients for the system. Other things we introduced was some compatibility. This is a Schneider PC compatible. They weren't really that compatible. <laughs> so we made some, some simple promises to make it easier for developers as well. Uh, because when you have a schema migration, so you, you actually need to add a field to a, a class. Uh, you're, you're breaking the, the compatibility with the previous uh, schema, so how should that be managed? And we define the way how it should be managed, and that is when you write a, f a field uh, that wasn't there before, it will just be added. Uh, when you read a field that isn't written in the database, so it's missing, uh, the field you have in your class is going to be uh, replaced with zero, null, false, or whatever in your language fits best. And the consequence of that is that you can actually read an old schema or an old object to a new uh, format, fill in the fields that were missing, and when you write it back, it's going to be upgraded. So that way, we don't do any batch upgrades to the data. We just uh, migrate it as we read it or as we write it. We don't write, do an extra write if we don't have to, because the, the old format is always compatible. So in this case, we added the, the pick small field, so it just becomes null. Other clever things you see here is that we don't use compressed strings, but we have our own byte arrays because we have a lot of strings of this type in memory for caching purposes. So a Java string is using a 16-bit 
char per character, and that's usually not necessary when you have URLs like the picture is. Um, so we use our uh, byte arrays instead to store strings, and then have functions to convert as we need them. We still allocate, I think, 600 to 800 megabytes per second when we when the servers run live. Uh, despite this, so we need we try to keep memory to a minimum whenever we can. We always trade CPU for memory because the garbage collector can eat so much if you don't tune it properly, or even if you tune it properly. Oh yeah. Yeah, so we, we use the JSON and the compatibility promise in, in some other cases. So we use it in the protocol when we talk to the mobile clients or the, the desktop in the data store, in the database, and also when we talk to memcached, which is the, the caching layer. Well, one thing, oh, well, I forgot to, to make a slide where we use memcached properly. So we use memcached in front of the databases, and we have around one and a half million reads to memcached per second, and then maybe 7% go through to the database. Uh, that we miss them in memcached. But we only have four terabytes of RAM in the memcached instances, but we have nine terabytes of, of RAM memory in the, in the database shards. So my question to you, has anybody any experience with removing the caching layer and running directly towards the database? If you do, approach me afterwards over a beer. I would be happy to hear about it, because that's something we would like to try, but never dare to do. <laughs> oh yeah, I have the slide. Oh, blind. <laughs> All right, this is how it works. So when we have the application server in the middle and we want to look something up, we talk to memcached first to check if it's there, and usually it is. Uh, so what the first thing we want to know when we need data is to check which shard is this user stored on, because each user has a mapping individually, so we can move one user to another shard if we need to. Um, if we don't find it in memcached, we ask a shard lookup database, which is a kind of a single point of failure, actually. I thought I would say it before some of my colleagues would say, hey, look, <laughs> dangerous, eh? It is dangerous, but it's, it's usually never down. <laughs> <laughs> if it's up, it replies with a, a shard ID, and in this case, one. So we ask for the data, and we get it back from shard number one. And uh, this is a very simple process when it works. And when you have three shards, it works fine. Uh, I think today we have 45 shards with SSD disks in them. So quite a few. And what happens when you have 45 machines, you know that one of them will crash at some point, And they do. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit later about that, what, how we handle failures and, and mitigate problems that come up. But first, a little bit about how we handle connections in the first place, because that also has an impact. Uh, so we have a connection pool, which we in Swedish call anslutningsbasseng. <laughs> uh, and then, if you have a connection pool and you have 45 database machines, you realize that you have a problem risking a deadlock. If you get a connection to one of them in one thread, and then one connection to database B, and you do the opposite in another thread, you risk waiting for each other's resources uh, in, in one way or the other. So there are different solutions to that problem. Um, this is four I can think of. I'm sure there's more. These are ones I've actually seen in production in, in various companies. Um, so you can use a connection and only do an operation on one connection and return it immediately. So you, you never take a connection and wait for another one. That will work, but it's inefficient to, because cycling a connection, if you need it again later, it would, would be expensive. Uh, you can use unbounded, unbounded connection pools. I've seen that a lot. Uh, not a very good idea. 
um, you can have some kind of connection order, and that's more common from the, the BSD kernel where you have a lock order. That's how I got the idea. So you can actually, if you want a connection to database shard 11, you take your connection to 0, 1, 2, 3, up until 11. So you always take them in the same order. That way you know that you're going to be blocked on the first request if you can't get the last. That works fine. Also quite parallel, could be. And then you have the global connection pool, which we use, where you sort of bake everything into one pool. So I'm going to explain a bit how that works. I think if I have a slide for that. Put it, I put it in the wrong... I don't have a slide for it. Oh, well. That slide was missing. So the way we do it is that we... Uh, um, we have a fixed set of semaphores that we hand out. So we have 20 available slots. And if you need a connection to any database, basically, you ask for one of those tickets. And if you get it, you have a, a whole pass to access any database you want. And in the, in the connection pools to the individual database, we always have 20 connections available. So if you, if you have the whole pass, you will get a connection from the pool when you ask it later on. Um, the, the problem with that is that if you want to access shard 0 and 5, uh, you grab this pass, and someone else wants to access 3 and 7. You could technically do it at the same time, but if you're out of, of these whole passes or these semaphores, you can't. You have to wait, even though you're technically not accessing the same resource. So it, it limits concurrency a little bit, but the, the simplicity of it is so much more worth than trying to sort out the, the deadlock, deadlock situations that might arise. Mm. And our queries are usually quite fast, so when we intercept the, the machines live and see how many database connections they're actually using, they are using maybe three or zero. So uh, it, it's not that big of a limit anyway. All right, so these are the things that you need to think about if you're not already, when you're using a lot of databases or a lot of machines, but especially databases. So a database shard can fail, and it will fail. And if you, like Facebook, have three and a half billion MySQL instances, they fail all the time. With Fortify, they still fail once a month or something. So to handle a shard that is completely broken, that's very easy. You just take it out of the system and you don't allow connections to it and then it's out and then you can retry every now and then and when it answers again you you fire it up and you you're good to go mm, and the way that works for the user is that if you happen to be on that broken shard you can't access the system boohoo <laughs> <laughs> might be good for you maybe you should do other stuff than play candy crush <laughs> But if you are only on shard zero and your friends are on shard one, um, you can still play the game, but you will only see the top list without the friends on shard one. So we, we fail very gracefully when we can't access data on a shard. We try to do as much as we can with the, with the data anyway. And that's important because you can't have all these up all the time. Another thing could happen that the the shard is slow, so it does return data, but not very fast. And this is the, the trickiest one to solve. So the problem in this case is that let, let's say the average response time is 0.3 milliseconds normally, and it starts taking 20 milliseconds to respond. Uh, quite quickly, requests are going to pile up in the application server, waiting for this shard to complete the, the queries. And it will literally break it for everybody. Even if we could serve other requests, the request queue in the application server will be full of requests just waiting for this single shard. Uh, it's, a, it's a complicated problem. Has anybody faced this problem? How would you handle if a database is slow? Customer has to wait, yeah. 
that could do it. But what we try to do, which is a bit of a hippie method, I would say, but it, it gets the job done, and that's why I'm sharing it, because it's not very common, but if you have it, it's, it works quite okay. So we monitor all the queries, and when a query starts to be slow, I think it's 10 milliseconds, wave if it's wrong. No, it seems to be correct. Uh, then we start throttling access to that database, and we only let one query through at a time. And we still throw the data away and just uh, do the query and see how long it takes. And we, all other connections to the database, we just refuse straight off. So the, the requests are going to finish quite quickly. It won't stall anything on the application server, but uh, we, when we get the data back, or when it starts serving data back fast again, we can put it back online for everybody to use. So the, the idea here is that there was some temporary glitch in the database making it slow, not a systematic failure, because then it would just go up and down, but something temporarily made it slow. So we shuffle it out, it can rest a bit, and then we shuffle it back in again. And that works quite well. It happens a few times every day here and there, and nobody really notices. Another problem that comes with having a lot of shards, there's a lot of focus on the shards, I'm going to be a bit brief now, uh, is when you have uh, heterogeneous characteristics. And uh, when you're evaluating your idea for a scalable solution, you might evaluate what, what I need to solve the problem today. And a year from now, you're going to hopefully have more customers, so you want to add hardware. And unless you bought IBM, that has sort of a stockpile of equipment from the 70s and onwards, where you can just buy the same hardware, you're going to have to buy a new type of hardware. And that's what happens. So we have database machines with <coughs> five generations worth of hardware, both combinations of SSD and RAM and CPU capacity, and they're a bit different, all of them. Uh, one solution could be, when you buy new hardware, throw away the old ones and replace it with a nice shiny rack. That's actually an option. <clears throat> Another thing that might happen is that they can get different characteristics from, from software as well. So old customers tend to gather more data, and that could make the database shard slow as well. Uh, so it's not necessarily caused by generational issues either. <clears throat> so this is a problem of maintaining some kind of balance between the factors that limit the, the performance of the machine. And uh, we do constant monitoring of the machines using the per per corner performance statistics. Uh, and based on the query performance, we choose to move users from one shard to the other constantly. And we have a job working all the time, sort of moving a few hundred users all the time, and maybe a few hundred thousand users every, every day are moved. So it, the, the cluster rebalances itself based on performance data. Uh, and we also try to put new players where there is space for them. So we manually configure and target the new database machines with new users, and then at the same time balancing for performance using this automatic system. Not very complicated at all. You need something to measure how well the, the servers are performing, so you get a metric for it or a scalar value, and then just start moving players. And it's extremely simple. Oh, well, in theory, at least. Yeah, so there are nice tools for Java to monitor <coughs> databases and JVMs, and more and more are coming now when the JRocket stuff is merged in. Uh, but we wrote tools for ourselves because we believe that the more precise we can be, the, the better the decisions we can make. So this is how we view our database shards. This is actually from a live machine. So we can see, so just scan through rough metrics about the database machines, and then we can see which ones are faster and which ones are slower. And these ones are approximately the same speed. Some are twice as slow as the others, but that could also vary over time. <coughs> we also monitor our system with our own tools. So this is how we monitor every request. 
So I cut out the request names on the left hand side because I don't want to share exactly what kind of API calls we have. But then we see sort of how many database reads each call made average, how many writes it cost. Uh, the first one there caused a lot of memcached reads, 250 on average. Uh, I believe that's getting the scores for the, all the friends and, and various data. And we can also see sort of how long it took to execute using box, box charge. Uh, and this is key to tuning performance of the system. You can't get around looking at the system and looking at it every single day. All right. <clears throat> Then I would love to share some, yeah, we have time. Some, something will happen, because when a company <coughs> grow like King did, it's uh, something you can <coughs> only experience once, I think, going from this small company to this huge uh, uh, customer base in such a short time. Um, <coughs> so I would like to share some of the things that happened during that time. Uh, because some of you will experience it, some of you have already. Um, so what happened <clears throat> when we had 5 to 25 million daily active users, <clears throat> and the daily active users is a standard measure for, for games online. That means just a player that arrived and, and played a little bit. <clears throat> so that's when we started realizing these problems. Uh, the database things actually started showing up. So we needed to, to address the database issues with the solutions that, we just ha that I just told you. Uh, we tried some connection pools because uh, some connection pools actually had internal uh, delays with a sleep and then retry after 50 milliseconds or so. And, and that's very bad when you have two, three thousand requests per server coming in just needed to be processed. So we also adding hardware in a pace corresponding to how we grow became a problem. Um, getting hardware, if you need SSD disks in volume, uh, you run into the problem that they're not manufactured yet. That was the, one of the worst problems we faced. So you call up one of the suppliers and they were, yeah, it's going to be a three-week delivery. And you call them, where are they? Still in the factory as components, like not very good solution. So then we had to order from several manufacturers that we knew had different factories to make sure that they would actually be delivered in time. That was nice. <coughs> and we also learned some lessons when it came to sizing the system, because you can listen to the expectations of business people, if you will. Uh, we're all business people since we are doing the business, but people with less insight in the consequence of not having enough hardware. So. Uh, I asked for an estimate, I think it was in uh, April, what, how many customers will we have in August, just so that we can buy enough hardware for the summer. Uh, and the response I got back was the number of customers we had one month earlier, so in March. <laughs> Not a very good prediction, because we're growing <laughs> exponentially. So we need some other tool to make uh, estimates. and. Uh, when you look at data, I mean, you can look at any data. You can look at database rights. You don't have to have business skills to see how database rights are ramping up. You don't need to know how many customers you expect. You just need to check what kind of hardware you need. And then what happened when we had more, more than 25 million daily active users, things started to become really problematic. So. This is an unboxing day. It's usually, when you look at YouTube with unboxing, it's really nice. They have an iPhone and they pack it up. But when you get sort of truck full of servers and you have to go out five people and just open boxes an entire day, then you're satisfied with that and that's it. <clears throat> then there are actually companies that do only that. So they're unboxing all the day. <clears throat> and other things we realized was that data overflow, sort of some pipelines, some network pipelines, and some disks were becoming dangerously full. And uh, 
since we store so much data, people complete levels in the games, and the more levels they've played, the more, the more scores we need to store, and we can't really throw it away. Even if they don't show up for half a year, we need to keep it, because they might show up again, and they expect their score to be there. So data was just growing and growing. And we, so far, we guarantee that they can, can come back in 10 years and still have their data. Oh yeah, and then we had to solve the heterogeneous problem. Another thing that was pivotal when it to, sort of came to designing this system, which was by no means an, an act of a clever mind. Uh, it was a learning process that was as much scary as it was uh, sort of educational. Uh, none of us, nobody had any experience with this kind of volume. The developers using the, the platform that we're developing had no idea either what to expect. So we were experimenting and listening very closely. And I have a favorite analogy that I would like to, to show since I'm, since I'm here and you're listening. Uh, and that was when it comes to testing, I've been in a few companies, a couple of companies that had to say no to customers uh, because they couldn't handle the volume, the load. Um, I won't say it's someone else's fault because I worked there. I was part of causing the system not to be scalable. Uh, but the, the common thing for the, both these companies was that they had a quite rigid process and uh, very good load testing facilities. They had extremely huge setups to do load testing for the system. So they could handle a lot of load. The problem was when the customers arrived, it didn't. So they had to say no uh, and lost a lot of money on that and, and momentum. So the approach we took instead was to, we were a bit clever when we designed it, we thought it would work, but instead of testing it until it worked, we launched it with a few customers and then we listened to the servers. So we added more and more customers every day and we saw how the servers behaved, we found issues, we fixed them, we continued to deliver and the, the cycle for actually delivering was so short that uh, I mean, you can basically hold your breath while you were making the change, committing it, making a dist, installing it, and restarting the server. It was that short. Um, so the analogy with the U-boat or the submarine is that, this is a Swedish submarine actually, Illen, from the 20s, is that when you build a submarine, uh, I'm not sure if there is any naval engineer here, but I don't think you can actually test it, pressure test it on land. Not sure. That if, if you can, my entire analogy breaks. So, <laughs> <laughs> so inspired by Das Boot, the movie, um, they got a brand new submarine and they take it out to the water uh, and they have to dive with it because they want to know how deep can it go. So they, they go deeper and deeper and all the engineers and people are listening to it and they are sort of aware that now something can happen. So they're really uh, alert when it comes to listening to problems and and detecting and fixing problems as they occur. And that's exactly how we were as well. So we, we took the service for a dive, and then we were on board, everybody were on board. We did it in the morning, during the workday we were checking, and then in the evening we didn't want to increase the pressure, so we just kept it as it is, and then more players on the next day. Um, I think that is the only way to properly load test the system that I can believe in, actually. You can, if you have a submarine, you can use a hose and, and sort of spray water real hard on it. And it's the same you can do with a server. You can throw some load at it that might be similar or equivalent, but it, it, never, it never is, I would say. I have five minutes left for questions. Do we have a mic? All right, you can shout as well. I can, I can see if I do this. So, I have a question. Yeah, so the question was regarding connection pooling and if it's globally handled in the cluster, that's how I understood it. 
And the connection pools are, are locally handled. We try to make each server independent. So each server has its own connection pool to the database, which means that with, mm, I don't think I can say how many servers we have, but let's say with 10 servers, there would be 200 connections to the database in total. Uh, and they will be managed individually by the, by the application servers. Yeah, if we use any service discovery tools, um, <clears throat> we don't have anything internally other than application servers, MySQL servers, and memcached servers. That's all we have. <clears throat> so, and the servers are not aware of each other. I, uh, so, <clears throat> we don't need to, technically, if I understand your correction, uh, question correctly, uh, the, we don't have a a coherence cluster between the servers. Uh, the database machines are, have a shared configuration which we put in a central location, and that's where all the, the servers get it from. Do you use this storage also for uh, financial transactions, or is it just for user data? Yeah, so the question was if we use the same storage for financial transactions, and the, the answer is uh, no. We use a much less reliable system for that. <laughs> <laughs> It's, fun, it's funny because it's true, actually. <laughs> so we stream the data, and that was in the, in the first picture. We had a stream of data with 250,000 events coming out of the system. And that's the financial data. So the 250,000 writes over there, they actually go to a, a file on disk. So every hour, we take this file, which is just a pack of events that happen in the system, and we move it to a Hadoop cluster. But that means if a server crashes during an hour and the disk is gone, we can lose up to an hour worth of data because we didn't manage to get it out yet. Or if there's something wrong that the disk is full and the application server didn't stop properly, it should stop before the disk is full, but something happens with the file, we, we might lose some financial data. And that's again fine with, with finance and, and the auditors. <laughs> <laughs> if we're running any A-B testing of different versions. And uh, we do that for, for the clients, for the games we run A-B testing. <clears throat> but the servers are always identical. So the servers for us are identical, even if you're in any A-B test group or any client type, if you're a mobile or if you're a web client, you're the same to the, to the servers. If there's anything I regret that I would have changed with this infrastructure, yes. <laughs> yeah. So this story should have been much better abstracted. I would like to have it so that it could be replaced. Uh, it's not today. It's very tied to JSON and the, the compatibility promises that we did. I would not have liked to have used transactions the way we do. We have a row lock guarantee almost. You can do an update and you get a lock and then you do your thing and you write it back. I would have liked some API that was more eventually consistent, so we could actually we could do it as a transaction for the time being, but then migrate to something that was uh, more eventually consistent later on. Just to speak of the things that I talked about today, other things, millions of things. But that's I have some colleagues here who started a couple of years ago, and they're uh, constantly replacing the old stuff with the new stuff, and that's part of the architecture to actually be able to throw components away and replace them with new components while not having to throw away the entire platform that we have. Yeah. Are you, you said you had one version of the app servers at one time. Do you, that means you stop every app server and upgrade. Yeah, so the question was how we do the upgrades since we have one version running all the time um, if we stop all servers. And the, the answer is yes, we do, actually. I might could have lied there and said, but. 
we do stop everything. And the, uh, the, the request or the guarantee that I want the developers to, to give me is that I can hold my breath while the system is down. So it can't take more than that. If it starts taking seven seconds, I would die. So like 30 <laughs> seconds of downtime could be okay every two weeks. That's roughly what we think is okay. Yeah, so the question was if you have any stateful sessions on the app servers, and we, we don't actually. So we, we don't have any <coughs> state that we need on the app servers. So if, if every single request was sent to a new app server, it would work fine. The system would be slow, but it would work fine. We have a tiny hand cache of five minutes worth of data in case the, the user comes back to the same server. But if, if it doesn't, that's okay too. Uh, we don't need the, the customer to come back to the same server. Yeah, where is the state? <laughs> I thought you were writing it down. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, we, the state is written uh, in one location, that's the database, that's the original. That's where we do all the manipulations. That's why we have the operations. So regardless of the order the requests come in, uh, the database state always decides what should happen. Uh, and then you have memcached, which is a, sto a version of that, uh, but you can't really trust it. You never read anything from memcached and write it to the database. You always do it in operation that just fresh data, lock it, update, and write it. So that's the master. That's why we have 50,000 writes per second, probably. <coughs> All right, I think that was my time, and uh, I would like to have some suggestions for new solutions over beer. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>